Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Let's Talk Assassin's Creed, the only one podcast for all things Assassin's Creed. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to episode 118 of Let's Talk Assassin's Creed. Uh, this episode was um, kind of caused by something that we discussed way back in October in episode uh, 101. Um, which we uh, released on the 16th of October. It was our Elise de la Serre um, character episode, which was the end of our Unity trilogy um, that we did in October. And um, joining us for that episode and returning again is uh, Mary Claude. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. <laughs> oh, it's our, our pleasure. We we had a great conversation. I mean, we were talking for more than an hour and a half, maybe an hour and three quarters um, about Elise and uh we had a bit of a bombshell, didn't we, when uh, Duncan <laughs> revealed to us that he hadn't read the Unity novel. How dare he? I know, but there's been a development, everyone. Declan, take it away. I, I want to say, in my defence, it's not my fault. <laughs> I blame Ubisoft. <laughs> like, the marketing for these books is non-existent. I don't even know books existed for the franchise, but yes... A good 50p find in a local charity shop. I have the unit in Humble. It really and... surprised me. I remember you, you sent me a picture on Discord, a DM on Discord, and you just said, look what I found in a charity shop. And I'm just <laughs> really, there can't be this many copies of, of the Unity novel about that you could easily find them in a charity shop. But anyway, happy days. So you've I, read the book. I just want to say, you got the easily part wrong. I looked in... My local charity shop, which is across the road, and I go in every day, 10 times, never any assassin. First Assassin's Creed book I found that was April, and I've lived in this part of, in that charity shop. I visited the charity shop for five years, and it's all forsaken in that charity shop. So oh, five nice. years, it randomly appeared. And Unity was literally one in a million chance find, because I had been to all the charity shops in my town, and for that to be there on that day was just miracle just pure miracle i'd say you've picked up two good ones out of the series then from your charity shop the only ones i advise people reading <gasps> because it's the only ones i've read <laughs> you know what i've just realized that means that in your town in your little town that you live in there is another massive assassin's creed nerd and you've probably <laughs> never met it's amazing yeah, it is it is what are the chances anyway <laughs> so um i mean where do we start? I, I, I reread the book today. I started <laughs> last night and uh, I got about 100 pages done last night. And then I read the remaining, what, 350 pages today. And I finished at about, I don't know, six o'clock or something. So a few hours ago, just to refresh my memory. I've taken some notes. But Declan, why don't you get us started with what did you think? Did you enjoy it? What kind of story did it tell? Uh, I enjoyed it from Elise's point of view. And... I respect what they did and what the story they told um, for Elise. And I loved how Arno is more like put to the back stone. Because there is some parts where he like, mm. pops up and he has a reflection on her diary. The only thing I say, and I want to get out first before we start into nice positivities, is the book is a disappointment, in my opinion, just on a small personal factor. That it doesn't feel like the game. It feels like it's telling a story that the game didn't tell. And it's kind of weird because Forsaken yeah. really does follow Assassin's Creed 3. And you can feel Assassin's Creed 3 in them pages. But this book, you feel like a new story, a new chapter. It's like a prequel to Unity. So it doesn't really feel like a companion novel to Unity. It feels like a prequel. And that was a bit weird to read. Yeah, I can understand that point of view. I think maybe that was on purpose, though, that their point was to tell it is a story, period. And we don't know why she didn't show up that much in the game, you know, more than she could have probably have to give us more background on her uh, and her story. And I guess they decided to put it all in the book which is nice <laughs> but um yeah I'm, I'm thinking it was on purpose that it wasn't to tell the story of the game but then in a novel which was was the uh if you read uh, all the asio uh books this is pretty much just the story of the game in a novel yeah. i think it yeah. was just to retell the story like the events 
that happened in the game, but then from a completely different point of view. And I, I can agree with that. I think, I mean, because I've read like this as a Brotherhood book, and then I read Forsaken, and Forsaken stood out to me as one of the best AC books I've read because of how it gives Hayfum's life. But reading this Unity book, I kind of feel like this should have been its own game. Yeah. It should have just been a novel, and I think that's where I've been struggled. Like, I can't fault the book. I think Elise's story is jaw-dropping, and Arno's reactions to Elise's journal is kind of something that I don't really see Arno in the game, but it is long time mm. since I played it. I just feel like this book should be a game, you know, and the way Arno handles things, his emotions towards Elise in the journal just shows to me that this is a different Arno to what I see in Unity, a more caring Arno towards Unity, towards Elise. But I may be I mean, lo- overlooking it. Yeah, well, I mean, Arno in, in the novel is Arno facing grief of having lost the love of his life and his, you know, companion, the only real companion he had for the longest in his life, to be honest. So I think he has a different point of view <laughs> than the brash young man who, you know, always carries the responsibility of the world on his shoulders and has sometimes a yeah sometimes immature ways of of reacting to what happens to him and whatever happens around him so it has definitely a different thing but that the argument that Elise should have been a game on its own that's one that I often do everywhere like this game should have been played from two different characters you play the whole the, the main story but from both point of views and then you can achieve I don't know, maybe you have the different endings, I don't know, but they should have presented this from both point of views. That would have been the best way of, uh, you know, make you play as a Templar in uh, in an interesting way, not just with Rogue. That's a really good point, and I, I've said many times in the last six months that <laughs> Unity would have been a more interesting and a more fair and respectful game, because there are, there are a number of set pieces in the novel that Elise goes through during the revolutionary period that we see in the game. And it would, but you made a really good point there, uh, Mary Claude, where it would have been a much better expression of the word unity for the player to have spent time playing as an assassin and time playing as a Templar, actually fighting Templars, you know, Um, because she she gets herself into some trouble a number of times. Um, (laughs) So yeah, Declan, I mean, you're, you're not wrong. I suppose the first two thirds of the book is events prior to the French Revolution or the, or the the Estates General anyway. And then the latter third of the book does very... No, it's wrong to say it closely follows, but it, it fills in the gaps of where Elise is going and what she is doing. And what also there's some good Templar stuff in there, you know, Templar politics and backstabbing and, and all the rest of it, which the game just doesn't show. Uh, no, the game doesn't really show you. You see a little bit of it in some of Arno's visions, but... Yeah, yeah. It, it creates a much more rounded picture and a much more complex picture of all the different um, shifting chess pieces uh, that are moving around in the revolution. Um, it's it's essential reading. Let's put it like that. For any Unity fan, it is essential <laughs> reading um, to fill in Elise's story and Elise's character. I absolutely agree, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll make one point, um, and I know that you have commented on this in the past, uh, Mary claude which is there are a number of, there's, there's several concept outfits for Elise. <laughs> um, but the one consistent point in the book is that, and the reason I'm discussing outfits, just to explain to those who are listening, is that Mary claude is a historical costume maker, and particularly for Elise de la Serre. Um, you can follow her on Twitter and we'll put a link to her Twitter and you can, <laughs> you can see all her amazing costumes. Um, but one thing you've always consistently said is she should have a hat. And she in the book, have a hat. she wears a tricorn and it's, it's called out many times that when she's getting dressed to go out of a carriage or out of the house, she wears a, tr- and I just think a tricorn hat is cool. Um, Haytham looked cool with his tricorn. Elise should have had a tri, at least with her tricorn and Arno with his beautiful blue hood. That would be such a great visual to have, have on the screen. Perfect. Yes. I mean, yes. you've seen now the, the pictures, uh, the image of the original concept art, the first one, the first mm. draft. Mm. Uh, she does wear a tricon. 
Yes. So you can ask yourself, was the book already right? You know, did Oliver Barden use this image to write his book? And then as he further wrote, you know, didn't really care. But then the image and the, 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 <laughs> the representation of Elise in the game itself got transformed through editing choices, I guess. <laughs> but the tricon remained. <laughs> it's a good point. He must have been, I mean, he, he clearly had the script for the cutscenes, which I'm guessing the script is done yeah. a number of years in advance of the game being released so that they can do the animation and the, the acting and the mocap. Because um, there, there are certain cutscenes in the book that follow word for word yeah. what we see in the game, which is great. And it's kind of nice because I'm reading it in the book, but I can see it in my head, yeah. um, which I, I really love. Um, but yeah, the, the Elise of the book is a li- dressed a little differently um, to the Elise of the uh, of the game, shall we say. And that, that just stuck in my head that she's got a hat. This is great. Just a, I guess as she would have it in that time period. Um, yeah. I mean, a lady has to cover her head, right? As much as she doesn't like to pin up, pin her hair up, <laughs> a mm. hat is needed. <laughs> mm. Absolutely. What other thoughts did you have, Declan, then, when you when you finished the book? Um, a very intriguing thought. Um, it's kind of weird, but when you read the book, it's as if Elise, when she wrote this journal, she was trying to pin a point about her life and facts that Arno needed to understand. Yeah. Because she does use the phrase quite quite a um, lot, you know, and that's dear reader when the second penny drops. Ah. So she's obviously trying to highlight to the reader, obviously Arno, that you need to understand that I wasn't always a Templar, I wasn't always locked behind a doctorate, that I've been just doing stuff for my mother in secret, you know, secret trot sword training i didn't know anything but then as life gone on the penny dropped and it was kind of interesting but the passive aggressive nature to arno as well that i noticed when her mother passed you know that you would never understand you were just a stranger in our household you wouldn't understand why we are griefing but you never seemed to get the message that we were all grieving because you still wanted to be that arno who hang around with my dad and dad seemed to pay way too much attention to Arno, which is creepy. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's for a, a, a different discussion altogether. I have my reservations about François Lasser. <laughs> Can I just make a quick point? Her father is evil. Like, <laughs> so I'm oh, so sorry. That's cracked me up because I, I when I read the book, and uh, because... Um, Mary Claude and I are both Unity nerds. I'm sorry, Declan. We might we might have you outnumbered tonight. And I remember messaging Mary Claude and saying, "I'm actually not of a very high opinion of uh, Monsieur de la Serre after reading this book. I, I I I'm so glad that you came to the same conclusion, Declan. This is great. Is that PG thirteen? Can I say he's a bit of an asshole? Absolutely. <laughs> not to be rude, he brings a known assassin's son into the fold. Which is a douche move, anyways. That's not fair. So I'm gonna say that's a douche move. He yeah. then gets his daughter to befriend said assassin's son. Mm-hmm. Douche move. He then secretly manip- tries to manipulate the child into being a Templar without actually dropping any Templar hints. Douche move. And then says, "Hey, you know what? You're his friend. You do it for me, daughter." Douche move. <laughs> you yeah. absolute. You literally forced at least to choose between a friend yeah and a code yeah yeah and i think that was one of the few acts of uh free will that she uh you know took upon herself as in i am not going to i don't want to say ruin arno but she didn't want to ruin the friendship she didn't want to ruin his own freedom to uh you know not be a templar and just live about his way and uh you know just grow up completely oblivious to everything um because he honestly probably didn't have much uh understanding about his father anyway um so i guess that was her choice as in i want to just have my playmate my friend i want to keep that so it's a bit selfish in a way but also completely you know her own choice and saying father screw you I'm not going to do it. Yeah, she makes a line, a comment like uh, when she's writing in her journal, so a, a line to herself where she says something like, 
I just want to keep Arno for myself, free of all of this assassin versus Templar stuff. And I think, yeah, yeah, that's nice. I can understand that. You've got a complex life already. You know, you're, <laughs> you're being you're being brought up. You're, you're having to mature very quickly because you're told eight years old that you're destined for this grand role. Um, and yeah, she just she has fond memories of just running around the house with Arno and running through the gardens, stealing apples and everything, <laughs> stealing jam as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They do a lot of stealing now, I come to think of it, I know, and at least. <laughs> children, I swear. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Uh, children. But, I mean, she does mention it in, I mean, that's for uh, also for later, but uh, she does mention in um, when she was uh, recalling her trip to England, um, saying that, uh, so what if my reasons for wanting to see him were selfish? That I see him as an escape from my everyday responsibilities, a ray of sunlight in the dark of my destiny. Does it matter when my only desire is to bring him happiness? I mean, this is more to me anyway the biggest argument to say that she never loved him. Oh come on! I wondered <laughs> if you were going to bring that point up. Yes. Yes, I'm glad you have. <laughs> you know what? Which passage that is? Absolutely, absolutely, and it's it's something that that some people say that. Oh, the relationship was not believable. Um, or I don't think that Elise ever really loved Arno. I mean, I'm no acting expert, but and I'm going to quote um, JV in his recent Unity review that mm. he published a few months ago. And he comments that the chemistry, and I don't know what it is about this game. I think Syndicate's very similar in terms of its quality of, of motion capture and animation of the characters, but... I think particularly with Unity, there's something about what they did. I don't know what magic they did, but they captured these characters on screen. And for me, the chemistry is obvious. It leaps off the yeah. screen. Um, and I was never in any doubt because I, I read the book after playing the game and it just reinforced my thoughts. I was never in any doubt that they loved each other very much and they were destined for each other um, forever. And the book reinforces that. As you say, I think it's when she arrives in England, isn't it? And I think perhaps she sort of realizes she's truly alone. Um, having left her home country, and then it hits her. There's only one person she really needs, um, and it's Arno, and it's cute. It is. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, that that leads us on then to something I wanted <laughs> to ask Declan about. So you, Declan, um, you've read Forsaken, you've played AC3. We know that Haytham Kenway is basically an 18th century James Bond, and he's awesome. <laughs> what did you think about the whole Kenway stuff that the novel covers? Disappointed. <gasps> Go on. Well, I'm kidding. Well, yeah. yeah, actually, I'm going to stick with disappointed. The whole... Okay. Oh, you're doubling down. No, Go for it, yeah, man. Go for it. This... Let's hear it. <laughs> Again, it's why I'm reinforcing the point I made at the start, why this didn't feel like it fitted unit. It should be a separate game. The whole point that <laughs> there is even a line after she meets Haythan Kenway's sister and she saw the letters and she saw how, you know, this Grandmaster is, you know, contemplating the creed and everything. And, and she even says, you know, later on in the book, and I can't remember who it was, about Arno saying, like, you know, maybe he is the one who can knight the two creeds. And to me, that whole meeting with the Kenways just blew the doors down for AC Law. It basically shows... A woman who wasn't an assassin or a Templar, but knew her brother was a Templar, mm. actually could persuade a Templar to actually look at both doctrines and think, hmm, maybe they're as bad as each other, but could unity work? And again, that's mind-blowing. You know, what she did was mind-blowing, but I would want to see more of it in depth. Yeah, exactly. That's the problem. They they touched on the on the topic, but then they didn't elaborate on it whatsoever, and they just leave us with a million questions. What were what was in the letters? Yes, what and, was in the damn letters? Come on. <laughs> and 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 what else? And who? Yeah, okay, we know Hayton wrote them, but you know what's in there? Why did he write them? When did he write them? Like what? What does it say? So yeah. It's a, it's a missed opportunity, but everything about Unity is honestly a lot of missed opportunities, but that's another mm. story. Mm. There, I can ask both of you, because you may know a bit more. There is one thing I don't understand about the whole Kenway meeting, is how did she not know Unity was... Not Unity. 
Mm. How did she know Elise wasn't who Elise said she was? Because she went on there under false pretenses, but she seemed to mm-hmm. guess pretty quickly that Elise was there for some dodgy business, not as a friend. And I couldn't work out reading between the lines how she came to that conclusion so quick. That Mile. is covered in the yeah. book. Go on, Mary Code. No, no, you, you can go ahead. <laughs> you probably um, should read it better. In the novel, so she arrives at uh, the Kenway mansion and she meets um, Jenny Scott, who is by then in her 70s, I think it would be. Maybe late 60s, but probably 70s. Um, so she's a, she's an elderly lady, by the standards of the time, certainly. Um, she's told straight away, She I think she meets Jenny immediately and is told, you know, Jenny tells her, I'm not very sociable, I don't like people. Okay, fine. So immediately there's an atmosphere there. Um, and then she spent, at least spends four days basically waiting in the house and Jenny won't see her. And that the, the house staff are evasive and saying, well, you know, Miss Scott is not seeing anyone um, today. She's not feeling so well. She won't eat with you, all of these things. And in that, four, now this is where I, I do wonder if this is stretching credibility of transportation mm-hmm. in the 1780s, but... In that four-day period where Elise is waiting to meet with, uh, oh, it's Yvonne. She's under the yeah, pseudonym Yvonne. of Yvonne Albertine, isn't she? Yeah. So Elise is waiting to meet with uh, with Jenny. And when the meeting finally happens, after on the fourth or on the fifth day, Jenny says, we've used this time and, and some of my contacts in the assassins, even though Jenny is not an assassin, she's kind of fed up with all of that crap, of that, that never-ending war. Um. She says, we've used this time to to con- make contact with our friends in France and learn the truth um, of who you are and why you have come here. So here's the thing, Declan. The book does explain how Jenny Scott realises that Elise is Elise and not Yvonne. But I'm not sure if you could ride from London to Dover, get a ship or boat to Calais and then ride a horse from Calais to wherever. I think it's... It's the city of Troyes, isn't it? I'm not actually sure where that is in France, but that does to me that seems to push the believability of how fast horses were. I don't know. I'm not an expert, but um, it is covered in the book. What do you think, Mary Claude? Yeah, no, that's exactly. Uh, uh, I'm actually looking up where the where the heck. That's kind of far away. Anyway, um, I'm doing the same right now. I'm looking it up on Google Maps because I want to know where. I, mean, I might have whole... even. The whole thing about the book, anyway, in, in the whole story, is that there's always an informant somewhere, somehow, that is telling someone, somehow, about what Elise is doing. Hmm. So, I mean, I, I'm, yeah, the time frame might be a bit of a stretch, but it doesn't surprise me. I mean, it wouldn't have even surprised me that even arriving in London and uh, asking to see Jennifer Scott, that someone would have told Jennifer already that Elise is coming. There were spies everywhere, um, spying on everything that she was doing. Hence the uh, ambush that that she almost fell for. Um, Mm. I mean, everything that she was doing, she, she was being thwarted by... All her plans were being stopped by someone who didn't want her to do anything. Not pursue being grandmaster, not, uh, you know, find the truth. Like everything that she was doing is there's always someone to stop her. So it wouldn't have surprised me that someone would have told Jennifer Scott already. <laughs> I think that kind of comes out. I think I did. I must. I didn't really explain what my, uh, my question. I think I understood the how she came to the conclusion. I think from somebody who's read a lot of books and played a lot of games and and seen a lot of films, it's just weird that on the first meeting, uh, meeting Yvonne, that Jennifer Scott was like, oh, okay, I'm just going to, like, you know, get some contacts, do some digging, and get this whole pretense of who you are. And I was kind of like, but why do you need to do all that? And it kind of just, to me, it felt like I didn't understand what the whole need was to d- dig into Elise's secret profile uh, to find the truth. Yeah. So I, I think that's covered as well, though, because the butler, Smith, mm. I think his name is, explains to Elise that, that uh, Miss Scott has had a difficult childhood. There was an attack on the Kenway mansion, as we know, mm-hmm. um, and that has made her very security conscious. 
So I I felt that was, you know, consistent and set up in the story. Um, it's, it's it's kind of one of those things, you know, this is an action adventure novel. It's not to be taken too seriously. Um, and when, when you read the book and you, of course, you know, the novel, the journal, shall we say, it only covers the, the most action-packed parts of Elise's life. But of course, when you read it, you think she goes from one action adventure sequence to the next, to the next. Her life is full of action. Of course it isn't. There are 10 years where she's just at school and nothing, apart from being caned, nothing is really going on. Um, and so getting that, out and they get it out at, uh, you know, at dawn to have the dew on the grass. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So it's... Yeah, so sometimes you read as you're reading this, you think yeah, this is a little bit too much drama for one person's life, but then you have to remind yourself, ah, it's an action adventure novel. Don't take it too seriously. It's fine. I don't know. I, I was able to suspend disbelief. Let's put it like that, and just, just sort of. Uh, I mean, there's no character in Assassin's Creed who hasn't had somehow uh, a, a bad childhood, or you know, lost a parent or two or more. Um, so True. yes, if you start from the first uh, uh, first time there was uh, the attempt on her life and her mother's life um, to until the end of the of the novel, yes, uh, a lot of things happen. But at the same time, she's a Templar. Um, it's it's an underground war uh, that has absolutely no mercy for no one at any time. You're just a pawn. You, no one will remember you in the history books, as Arno says in his speech at the end. Indeed. Indeed. Um, oh, just, there was another point I was going to make about um, the Kenways. Um, I don't know how you used to feel, but I feel that I would have liked to see the Kenway situation handled a little bit differently. You know, I know that close to the end, Jenny Scott is a bit more friendly with Elise and... Um, but I don't know, I just kind of like the whole waiting for four days, the suspicion, looking into the past, just kind of like you're wasting four days of time where we could have learned a little bit more about her and the Kenways and what happened. And I would have liked to see like more yeah. four days where Elise and Jenny are basically discussing philosophies on both doctorates and discussing the letters together, not just mm. like... Yeah. He's a little get out, and now the carols are coming for you. It's kind of like, eh, you know, you what? Well, it's a bit rushed. We need, I need more. And again, this was the first book I read after Forsaken, so I still had Forsaken in my mind of Hey from Kenway's story and everything. So I was maybe a bit too judgmental when I got to like the Kenway side, expecting a bit too much because this is. Elise's story, but I did want a little bit more for the Kenways to connect with her, if that makes sense. We, we definitely missed a bit of the philosophy of yeah. the Creed and the Templars and what had Haytham discovered or, or learned about himself. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that it was simply too hard to come up with anything deeply philosophical and meaningful so the writers just kind of skipped over it or the writer just skipped over it said there are some letters don't worry about what those letters say. yeah exactly but you're, you're absolutely <laughs> right Declan it would have been nice because you know the like the first Assassin's Creed game is very much kind of a, a study of the philosophy of the creed and and we see other characters growing up I mean Arno's speech at the end of Unity that's him at the end of five years of, yeah. of losing everyone and growing up but to understand maturing to understand the creed and um, so clearly, writer, talented writers can write these these thoughts and these speeches. And it would have been nice to have had something, like you say, for what did Haytham think? What conclusions had he drawn from his life? Um, I mean, we also know that her mother was most definitely looking more for a middle solution. Mm. I know it's there, probably the link with the Kenways somehow, but how and what's the link and, and how... How did it? How did it get there? <laughs> it's a missed opportunity. We need more information, but I don't think we're ever gonna get it. <laughs> I don't think so. I think you're right. I'm guessing there's one of the things I like about this era in the game. So from from Black Flag and its novelization, which I think kind of starts right at the end mm. of the 1690s, through I haven't actually played Freedom Cry yet. I need to play that. But you've got this endless series of books and games through Rogue and then ending with Unity, we've got this big kind of global 
web of characters and stories. And I think it's great. I really like this period of the storytelling um, within the universe. Um, and yes, there are many gaps, but I, 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 there are many gaps in our knowledge, but I'm guessing there isn't really room to fit another game in. Maybe a future, a book or a comic or something. No, a might, book could be. Cover. Yeah, yeah. And then a novel. They're, they're expanding with so many novels that are linking characters to, uh, you know, new characters to existing characters. So why mm. not? <laughs> why mm. not? Absolutely. If we're talking about novels connecting, can we not get another Unity prequel with Freddy and Elise's mum? Uh. I need to learn more. I like that guy. I want to know more. <laughs> Come on, give me some more. Who is he? What's he really like in his past life? How badass was he growing up when he was younger? And what is his connection to Elise's mum? I want to know. Can I just say, Death, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Your your conclusion there is exactly my conclusion when I finish the book. I want to know more about Freddie Witherell. The guy's a legend. He's fantastic, but I mean, we don't see him in the game, which is already kind of annoying, but okay, get it. He's part of Elise's life, not part of Arno's life, which is actually true if you look at it, because, you know, he was never involved. Um, but yeah, <sighs> such a legend, such a guy, especially at the end. Can mm. we speak spoilers or not? Oh, ab- absolutely. <laughs> I mean, if you're listening oh, okay. to this episode and you haven't read the book... Your problem. Yeah, too late. <laughs> We're going for it. No, I mean, <laughs> and the, how he just kills Rudok at the end. <laughs> Oof, yes. <laughs> Throwing the, <laughs> the sword like a knife. <laughs> oh, it was brilliant. Badass. I'd forgotten that scene and rereading it this afternoon. Yeah, I was like, my God, he didn't... I, 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 in my... As we got to that scene, I thought, oh, no, it's just going to shoot him. But no, nope. he threw a sword at him across the room. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> he just threw the sword like it was a knife and he just yep. got him in the head. <laughs> I think I think Freddy just overall is a legend. I was just, quickly as you were talking, I was looking for like some Freddy quotes and I just stumbled on by accident. Just how much he's always flirting with Lisa's mum. Oh, uh, like, I really uh, think that's really sweet. There's, they, obviously, they had something many years ago. Yeah, I mean the 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 parts where Elise um, describes how he reacted to her mother's passing is kind of heartbreaking because yeah, the guy basically saw the love of his life die, and he couldn't probably hug her and kiss her the way he would probably want to because he's not allowed. He's not the husband, is he? <laughs> that's a good point i hadn't thought of it like that but yeah he can't grieve openly no i mean he, he was allowed in the room but um you know that that was it it was i think some kind of a courtesy like oh yeah well uh, um, we know you had a thing with, with with her so we'll allow you to uh, go see her <laughs> we'll, we'll allow you to go see her body and then and then you're gone eh? <laughs> yeah I mean, I have my head cannons, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I know I shared them with James, but uh, I'm in in my head they were destined to get married, him and Julie. But in the end, it couldn't. I guess from some sort of alliance that had to be made between Templars to ensure whatever. So she had to be married to Francois, and uh, yeah, I mean, my head cannon goes further. That probably Elise is probably not even Francois de la Serre's daughter, but. <clears throat> Who knows? <laughs> I mean, he's so in. Uh, um, uh, Freddie is so involved in Elise's life in a way of a mm. father, mm. even when her father was still alive. So, why not really? Well, he was too busy being a father to Arno. When I finished the book, I had the same, or not even finished the book, even halfway through. He, Freddie, cares for Elise so much. My thought was. There's only one explanation for this, yeah, and that's he's her father. What, what did you think, Declan, to the relationship between Freddie and uh, Elise? Um, to be honest, I kind of got the same vibe. That <laughs> it was a very, it wasn't a very. Um, I read a lot of books where men, there's mentors and people train apprenticeships, but there was a very paternal vibe to it, mm. Mm. and it's 
everything they did together felt like he was trying to protect her, you know, trying to get her to see sense. And even after he killed uh, Rudek with the knife, you know, he, the quote in it is, it literally says, you know, the grim satisfaction as he put a ghost to rest. Yeah. That's not a guy who's just, you know, oh, well, he killed, you know, he's probably Some ruined my project's life. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my project was chasing after him, and now she's dead, it's fine. It's like a father just like, yes, I've killed the man who you were chasing after for so long and you never got to kill. And I wonder if he is his fa- her father. Can it be my who canon too? And I was like, knock out. <laughs> I mean, oh, we're three no. out of three here. You're aren't absolutely we? allowed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But, I mean, there, there's something about, yeah, the relationship, how, um, you know, at first uh, Julie was, uh, you know, ha- allowing him to come see Elise in a kind of a secret way. And then how he slowly got more important and took more time. I, I'm somehow I, I'm thinking that Francois probably knew that Elise wasn't his, but, you know, he needed an heir. So, hey, we'll take what we get. Um, probably reluctant at the, in the beginning, and then like, okay, well, if if we're going to train my future grandmaster daughter, might as well have the best swordsman of France, you know. So okay, fine. And then he was too busy being a father to Arno, so at least uh, uh, Freddy could be a father to Elise. Um, yeah, yeah. We all came to the same conclusion, Declan. I'm now wondering, is it possible on the little head kind of note of, you know, him being Elise's father, that one of the reasons why Elise's birth father, according to the book and the stories, took to Arno a lot more because he could raise a child that he could call his own because he's not got no dad, where Elise would never know that Freddie was her dad, but he would always know that her real father is out there it's kind of like a weird head canon but i could see him taking to arno more knowing like i could do train you i could do everything better than freddie could because i'm slightly jealous of freddie because <laughs> freddie took oh no i think he's very jealous I-, I think if he could challenge him to a sword fight he probably would and ultimately lose because freddie's just epic he's the best <laughs> i want more freddie yeah agreed that- I have to tell you what, right? If you wanted to just, sorry, I just had this thought pop into my head. If you were to make a game of Elise's story or or certain sequences that fit into the Unity game we've got, Elise training with Freddy would be a fantastic tutorial mission. Yes. To to, (laughs) to the melee combat, you know. it's, I can't believe something so perfect has been written in the novel <laughs> that would translate into <laughs> gameplay. It's brilliant. So but, many wasted opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and the other thing is Elise has a habit of kicking people with her sort of her massive high-heeled boots as well. And that would be quite a nice uh, thing to see as a melee kind of combat finisher. Not quite know, a Spartan really. kick, but Not kinda. quite, <laughs> but kind of like a, a sort of a circling scissor kick or something. I don't know. It'd be amazing, but can, sorry. Can we have uh, also a uh, uh, thigh... Uh, Neck crush. Uh, <laughs> You're going to have to explain that to those who haven't read the oh, novel. Goodness. When was it again? Wasn't it about that trip again to London? I mean, you're the one who read it. I, all right. I read all right. It. Let me take, I'll take it away. So um, this is where the novel jumps forward into the, uh, and it, it fits closely with the events we see in game. So um, if you remember when Arno escapes the Bastille with Belek. He doesn't immediately go to the assassins. He he's in a he's in another one of his drunken, depressed <laughs> states. Poor Arno. Um and he I forget the time. It's a number of days later after escaping the Bastille, maybe a few weeks. And maybe not that long. Do you know? What? Doesn't matter. He goes to find Elise in the Delassaire's house in Paris. They have their main house in Versailles. And they have a main house in Paris, although they're in two different locations in the book and in the game. But anyway, um, when he finds Elise there, she is depressed. She is very angry with Arno. She blames Arno for for killing or indirectly killing her father. What we don't know, what we don't see in the game, but is covered in the book, is one of the reasons why she's in that very poor mental state 
yes, she's grieving for her father, um, but also she has been attacked in her house in Paris um, by, I was going to say assassins, but they're not assassins no. as in members of the Assassin Brotherhood. They are they are killers They're who thugs. have been sent. Thugs, Lots. yeah, who've been sent to kill her. And she defeats them. Um, but the, <laughs> here we go. The way that she defeats one of them is I by... I have the passage here if you want me to Oh, read go, it. go on, please do. Please <laughs> okay. do. Um, I jumped, grabbed the banister strut, and in the same movement, gripped Hook's neck between my thighs and twisted. I twisted hard, trying to break his neck at the same time. But breaking men's necks in a scissor hole was never a major part of Mr. Weatherall's training, and I didn't have the strength to wrench his neck hard enough. Even so, he was now between me and the pistol, which was my first objective. Blah, blah. She tried. She couldn't break his neck. But she tried. <laughs> But no, it's not part of Weatherall's training, but I would still like to see that as part of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Special combat finisher where you, you crush the, the neck or snap the neck between your thighs. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Anyway. <laughs> Is it hard? <laughs> Is it hot in here? <laughs> I don't know. I think the heating's on very, very high. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what were we talking about? Let's, let's return to, I, uh, to something else. I have a question about Freddy. <laughs> mm. Again. <laughs> um, I have to ask because it's the only thing that has left me with the biggest fault process since I've left the book but when Ellie's mum is mate, taking Ellie to meet Freddy and she's asking you know where would you see him would he be up a tree you know he's out there I can see his shadows why does that scream like Freddy is a trained assassin I, I don't know he just doesn't seem like he would be that's what Templars do. You know, Templars manipulate from behind the scenes. Freddy seems more like an assassin gone over to the Templar side. But I don't know, it could just be me. That's interesting interpretation. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I hadn't thought of it like that before. Hmm. Plus, my my other my <laughs> other counterpoint to this is Xiao Jun from Chronicles. Yeah. Xiao Jun uses a knife boot thingy. Yeah, and I believe that Elise's mom was may have also trained with Freddy, and Freddy makes a comment about. I think it was Elise's mom's uh, knife boot. I can't remember where it was. Bear with she me. Keeps, she keeps a dagger in one of yeah, the boots because exactly. that's what she uses yeah. to defend herself or her and Elise when they're attacked by Ruddock and the lamp lighter, um, in uh, in Paris when when Elise is eight years old. That's before they meet Arno, I think. Six. 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 Okay. That's, when, mm. that's when the first penny dropped. Mm. Mm. I kind of read it, and this is kind of me just being totally backwards, is it's a hidden blade in the boot. Xiao Jun yeah. had a yeah. hidden blade in her boot. It kind of just got me thinking, like, what if Freddy's, you know, did a shay on us? You know, he was trained assassin, and he went to help the... <laughs> Who he knows? Went... Hey. And that's Could why be. he's the best swordsman, because... If you see all these assassins fight, they're bloody good. <laughs> I, you I'll know, tell Elise, you. In, in the book, at least comments on that when Arno and Belek are fighting in Saint Chapelle. Yeah. She comments something like, you know, you've I've seen people fight with swords, but watching these two trained assassins at the peak of their abilities was, you know, on a whole other level. Um oh, I like that, Declan. That's a great theory. I want someone to write. The, like, do you remember that program? What was it called? Like the young, the young days of Indiana Jones or the young Indi Indiana Jones Chronicles? I want the young Freddie Weatherall Chronicles. <laughs> but is there? Don't the assassins, in a way, with all their superpowers, let's call it, let's call them like that, have yeah enhanced abilities for <laughs> swordmanship and uh, I guess mm. uh, weapon handling? Mm. So I would think, yeah, uh, uh, Belek and uh, Arno fighting together. You have two assassins with extra powers. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And and Freddy, yeah, that would kind of work. Oh, no, what we know, learned about him in the novel. I love that. I mean, Plus, I mean, we all know that Shay is not the only turncoat. You know, no, no. people have been going from one to the other mm. since the beginning of time. Mm. I guess. <laughs> absolutely. Plus, I have to say, and it goes back to what you guys were saying about the final competition with Ruddock. I know he trains to throw knives after losing the ability to keep walking his leg properly. Yeah. 
but a sword. The way distribution between the blade and the handle, <laughs> the way he's effectively meant to do it. The only other person I could think of being able to yeet a sword like a knife <laughs> through the air is if Altair was given 10 yeah. months training. Assassins have such goddamn marksmanship that I could see Freddy having basic throw knife training, turning turncoat, and then realizing, okay, I may not be able to use my leg, but I've had five years on throwing knives, I'm going to hone the skill better. Hey, look, I can throw swords now. <laughs> Literally, he can run circles around anyone, but I am headcanon that he was a turncoat assassin, and I don't care if he was because that makes him more but, and legendary. That, that could be a good reason why he couldn't marry Julie de la Serre. Well, Julie, Ooh. whatever name she has, because we don't know. <laughs> She's always just called Julie de la Serre. Hmm. Oh, that's brilliant! That's almost so perfect. That's, per- that's hmm. brilliant. I mean, <laughs> I could, I could see her considering, like you know, um, that she's so much about a third way and uh, solution of uniting both. Maybe he, maybe Witherall joined the Templars to be with her eventually, but they still said no. Yep. Or his influence okay. convinced her that, that peace was possible because he was an assassin like Arno and Liz <laughs> from the two opposite yeah. sides. It's oh, so perfect. Uh, although, although he was kind of, <laughs> maybe he was disillusioned at one point though, because he was trying to convince Elise of her, yeah, utopic ideas of working together and going like, you know that that was a nice dream that your mother had, but uh, you know life is <laughs> such no such life <laughs> is True. possible. True. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he had that thought because, unlike Elise, he's actually seen it from both sides. Yeah. Maybe okay. he's like you know saw the done the done an Arno, you know saw the extremism of the assassins, and now he may have looked up to Elise's father. And then saw how the crows just basically stabbed him in the back. Yeah. And now he's like, okay, I've seen both sides. At least just don't. It's not worth it. And honestly, you know, what's the cause of death of Julie? I'm still, I'm still convinced she was poisoned, but you know, I think it's a la arsenic kind of yeah. way that yeah. it, it doesn't show it. It'd be just kind of you look like you have you have cancer at one point and you just die. But uh, it was like lead poisoning or, you know, so- something that is preparing her food, getting a little bit in and uh, slowly letting her die. Mm. Mm. Let, let the process take time so it's not too suspicious. I mean, it's it, all roads lead back to the carols, the, the English Templars, don't These they? assholes. Yes, <laughs> exactly. These exactly. Assholes. And, uh, well, I, I may have got rather excited when uh, May... Carol got stabbed. <laughs> that bratish daughter of theirs. She had it coming. I'm sorry. She had it coming. Yes, <laughs> definitely. Is it me, or did the Carols just come off like a very stereotypical British posh self entitled group? Yes. <laughs> just not so harsh. As a British person, I can dig us because I'm British, but she just came off, especially the daughter, she just came off like a typical bratty, I'm better than you because I got money. No, love, you drink tea every day with biscuits. You're not better than anyone. <laughs> Absolutely, mate. Yeah. What does she call Elise? Snot bag, is it? Something like that. Yeah. And- I think every time she meets her. Yeah. She's petty. Mm. Mm. I mean, she, like- would, she wouldn't have made a good fighter. And, and by that, I mean, you know, somebody who would be, uh, you know, with reason and uh, good, at, good in politics of a kind of way. No, no. Nah. She would have been the shame of the family anyway. So she had it coming. Mm, absolutely. I wonder if I might um, wind the clock forward um, to October 1789. Um, there's a segment in the book um, <laughs> where Elise has kind of decided she needs to try and assert her control over the Templars. Um she arranges a meeting in, uh, I forget the name of the person, Pimo, Pimolan, Pimodan, I can't remember. Pimodan, yeah. Uh, yeah. A hotel, yeah. Yeah, that's it, thank you. Yeah. And there are no supporters there. Instead, it is an ambush. Um, now that, again, that's a great sequence. It could be a playable sequence, but whatever. She she escapes the crowds of Paris and the ambush, and she lands um, 
awkwardly, she jumps down off of a bridge onto a barge that's passing through on the river. Um, breaks ribs, injures herself very badly. But what's very interesting in that end of that chapter is that she's reflecting um, on what's happened. And she, it's, that, it's at that po- moment when she realises how much she's failed her father because she's yeah. failed to try and follow his his surname and follow the family and bring control of the Templars. And it feels to me that it's at that moment she focus, she switches her focus solely onto revenge. She's not interested anymore in rebuilding or, or controlling or anything with the Templars. It's all about that focus on um, revenge for those that have killed her. And one of the things that I, I realised reading the book, and it's, it's referenced a couple of times, is and I don't think I don't think I don't oh she definitely resents it but mm. it doesn't change her love for Arno but what she comes to realize when she's reunited with Arno um which we do in at the end of sequence six in the game which I think is 17 yeah, it's the end of March 1791 um Arno has stolen her revenge from her because he's killed Sivere he's killed the Wadatun um, and she's she's pissed off. <laughs> she wanted to take that revenge, and he's kind of stolen it from her. And again, I think that that focused her attention even more on she will take the final revenge. She will not allow Arno to take it. And I think that's why the events play out as they do um, right at the end in the temple. Um, Germain is escaping, potentially, again. And she does not want anyone else to take the revenge that is hers alone. Um, and I thought that was a nice bit of yeah. consistent character development between the novel and the game. Um, and I, I, I respected that um, that detail. But I still hate the end. ending of the game, but I respected <laughs> yeah. that consistency. <laughs> but then you you get that part of the story by reading the novel. You don't get it from looking at her in the game, who goes from you know all cheerful in the beginning to this completely mindset uh uh <laughs> my life is not to save of whatever she's saying um it's not yours to save um you see you see what happens with her but you don't understand where it comes from good point and that's that's what I will always annoyed me with and i that's why i also understand the comments from you know, people in general uh, well, I don't know. Elise, she, 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 half the time she was pissed off at Arno, and uh, he was never doing anything good. She never loved him. <laughs> um, but then, if you read the novel, you will understand. You will understand that she had an attempt on her life, and she saw this as, as one of the biggest failures of uh, holding the the Lazare name. Um, that was she was failing her father. She was grieving him all over again. Um, but you don't get to see that. And that grief was never resolved properly, just like her mother's grief was never resolved properly, and then she just descends into madness. Mm. But you don't see that. You see her descend, but you're doing, what's her problem? (laughs) It's a good point, because in the game, it's only right at the the very final sequence, and I felt it straight away. And again, I think this is just credit to the acting Mm. and the animation and the motion capture. And there's that iciness in the air when they oh. when they speak on that rooftop overlooking the temple. Her straight face, away, the I, look in her yeah, eyes. Yeah, she and I, 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 well, I, I felt. I mean, I, I played all the other Assassin's Creed games, and I was like, "Come on, someone's going to die," but because they always do. But I thought, "Hang on a minute, we're in the very last sequence. We're in the very last memory. Surely it would have happened already, so it's not going to happen." But when that cutscene plays out, the look on her face, it really again credit to the to the people that did the animation and the character design and the actors for bringing all this emotion onto the screen um i thought oh shit Mm -hmm. oh shit this is not good but you're right none of that is covered in the game until you get to that scene well it kind of very it's hinted at at the execution of louis where she says you know i'm not going to make this mistake again but in the book we do get more of a build-up that her kind of mental state is declining however when I was rereading it today, I do think I, I think the book kind of skims over it a bit and doesn't really make a clear argument for, you know, um, why she's why I don't know. Maybe, maybe I've not thought it through properly, but mm. 
I got to the end and thought, it's like two sentences that are kind of thrown into the last couple of chapters. Yeah. And I thought, ah, she maybe says she has have... to write letters. and uh... Yeah, yeah. And I just felt the book could maybe have prepared that as a longer running thread. Um, I mean, you know, you don't need to, you don't need to think for too long to say everything she's been through in the last five years, and she's not going to let Germain escape again. I get it, but I wonder if the book could have just laid that thread more carefully earlier on and gradually built up to it. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we know how it ends, but um, yeah, I felt that was a little abrupt. That's the right word. That that mental switch, as it's described in the book. That's true. I did have one other gripe about the story, which I'm going to share. And I'd love to get both of yours opinions on this. So I'm going to let uh, Mary Claude do the correct pronunciation, but the school that she attends as a teenager. Yeah. Um, the Maison Royale. Thank you. <laughs> the or as she pal- called it, Palais de, pal- de la Misère. You're right. Pal- exactly. Palace of yeah. Misery. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and even Arno refers to it as that because he gets her letters, which I think is great. Um, the head teacher, headmistress, is Madame Leven, I think. Uh, Leven, yeah. And she's a very unpleasant headmistress. She's a very unpleasant, cruel person. And then she switches to being this very caring, I've only been trying to educate you all this time. Of course, I care about you. That was, that was so, again, a very abrupt, and it's, Okay, I get it. And it's please needed. come live here on on I know. The borders. Here's yeah. it, it, here's a lodge for you. Huh? <laughs> right, and I'll oh, guess what you can. I'll help you go on your. And now, of course, I get that it had to happen to set up the trip to London, but that needed to be more carefully written in the earlier chapters, so that she wasn't just this cruel head teacher. Um, you know, there was kindness established and it wasn't established in, uh, from my reading of it. And then suddenly she was being helpful yeah. and, and um, compassionate. That's the word. Um, you know, I know you've been grieving for your mother. Well, you could have mentioned that 10 years ago, you know. Yeah, exactly. um, so that that kind of a little bit jarring for me. Um, and yeah, she, she turned out to be a good guy, good girl even. But it was a bit odd. Um, yeah. It was another missed opportunity. Mm. I mean, we can mm. debate on uh, the author's talent for writing <laughs> and writing women in particular. <laughs> That's a discussion that we've had as well. Yes. Although I don't find him that bad for this one. <sighs> At least if we could just consider Elise as a character. I mean, yes, a lot mm. of things happened to her, but there was no useless rapes or, you know, drugs or almost have alcohol induced sex in the US version, but that's for the US version. We need to talk about the US version. <laughs> so we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. But yeah. I think I forget who I was talking to. I think it might have been Louise who we had on the show last week when we were talking about Lydia Fry. It may not have been, yeah. so I do apologize, Louise, if, if it wasn't you. But we were talking about it was the it was the previous book, uh the one that you've read, Declan, Forsaken, where we have Jenny Scott. And the way that he writes about her, it's I don't know what the right word is. Sexist might not be the, the right word, but he, he kind of piles on the misery to a female character beyond the point which is really believable or necessary. Um to the point where you almost think, are you, are you being a little bit excessive here? <laughs> a bit sadist. Um, yeah. <laughs> and the, 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 there is a subreddit called Men Writing Women. Oh. And people call out where men have terribly written women. And it, it's both hilarious and sad, um, the tropes that, that male writers fall into. And actually, when I was reading this book again today, I didn't feel like you fell into any of those tropes except once he does mention her growing bosom and i just think you don't, you don't need that in there she's a teenage girl whatever yeah. no one needs to know that it doesn't add to the story it doesn't add to the character so there is one time when he definitely falls into that really awful um, men writing women trope but the trying to be balanced the rest of the time i felt it was okay what did you think marie claude you, yeah you have i mean written it, it, many many pages <laughs> no but it's um um, I, I'm pretty sure I fa- I'm falling into tropes as well. I'm not a professional writer. Um, 
I did I didn't find it that bad. Yes, there's a pylon of shit happening to release, but it's kind of expected. You know, like, it doesn't feel like it's just adding up for the point of I don't know, yeah, making it sadist or or making it like too much. Yes, there's a lot of shit happening, but it's yeah, it's normal, expected. You can assume that it's logical, knowing from which family she's from and how many enemies uh, of her family are around in England and in France and probably beyond. Who knows? But I, I kind of, ex- yeah, didn't find it that bad. <laughs> But there are, here, there are holes. <laughs> there are holes here and there, but that's... Yeah. I mean, we have about Jennifer Scott. We don't have a lot about her in Unity. We've discussed that already. But it uh, could have been nice to have a little bit more. Helen is not really fleshed out. A little bit, but not quite. Uh, Madame Levine, uh, like you're saying, she's from being an, an ogre to being uh, a nice uh, confidant almost uh, guidant for uh, for Elise where, where did that come from yeah yeah Declan would you like to say anything I've been waffling on for ages <laughs> same sorry <laughs> I think that, um, again this is me just coming off a guy who reads a ton of random books that you can find at the charity shop I think the problem mainly is because and um, I'm trying to reference Forsaken and Odyssey's novel but I don't have them at hand but they all seem to try and keep and I'm trying to get to the last page of the unity novel to like the 400 300 page mark for the ah, interesting yeah. book and it's a very it's a very typical trope because the problem is you write a book that's too long I'm, you know, trying to get through Stephen King's The Stand, which is 1,100 pages. Holy shit. Yeah, and that has so much detail, and you kind of think, eh, you don't need all that detail. Like, come on, let's get past the story. But then you can get the other side, where you get a book that needs detail, like the Unity novel, where there are a constraint of 500 pages, because that is enough to keep people's attention. Mm. But you have to chop so much put stuff on the co- on the corner floor that it's like they could have written more character growth if they exceeded the I really think and I really wouldn't care I could see this book being about 600 pages with a bit more flesh out for some characters like Helena or two um, novels two or tones. two I could yeah. see two you like don't... a pre, pre-revolution and during the revolution Yeah, that would you know. work really well and then if it is a through the revolution tome of 300 pages we could get a deeper into sight into at least his brain and how she's feeling through the french revolution you know mm. that's the biggest problem mm. you know that the french revolution is the backdrop yeah. but because the story is trying to move it at a certain pace you don't get elisa's reflection that much on the current climate it's just i True. need to do my mission True. i'm going ahead and i'm going to agree with Maria Claudia, that we should have had two tomes. Two tomes would have been really nailed it because I, I mean, we would have gotten more Weatherall if we have like tome, like yes. book one up to 1789, basically, and then book two, 1789 uh, until 1794. That could have been a bit, mm. uh, and we could have had split. more. Jenny Scott and again I know we all hate them and they are evil and they're stuck more up carols. people. Yes, more <laughs> carols because more carols. Yeah. I will yeah. defend that scene where unit uh, where Elise frees Ruddock and you get the whole confrontation in the tavern. It did tie up the story well, it got to the point fine. But it was also at the same time felt rushed. Hmm. You know, there could have been a bit more, you know, it just felt like it got to there, like, four days, she does nothing, boom, we're now making a move, boom, there's Rudder, boom, yeah. it's done. I yeah. want more, I want more arguing with the Carols, more in-depth into why the Carols suck. <laughs> <laughs> As, more, you know, I actually want, 
I, I know I should not be thinking this, but I actually want a part that Elise and like before Elise goes after Ruddock, that her and the Carol Zuma daughter, I forgot her name, actually have a fight. You know, she gets sick and tired of her crap and she knocks her on her ass and you know, that's the biggest motivation for the dad to like, you know, you take Elise. You bloody her sword and you kill her because she mocked you and we give her a home. I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm a weirdo. I just think it'd be just funny to see her knocked on her ass by Elise because I think she was an annoying snotty brat all the way through to Elise. <laughs> like calling a snot bag was evil. Absolutely. Elise was nice. Can I make Three. two points on the length of the book, right? So the version I've got, I guess we've all got the same version. 466 pages is the last page of the story. I'll make two comments here, right? The margins are very big and the typeface <laughs> is huge. <laughs> they yeah. could have they could have fitted a lot more story into this length of book, into this right. number of pages, with just a smaller typeface and smaller margins. It's quite comedic how big the words are on the page. True. And anyway, those so are my you... out of universe observations about the length <laughs> of the book. To be honest, as a quick reference to that, I've just pulled up my um, Discworld book now, mm. and that's five hundred pages. So it's three books in one. And actually, the book is bigger than the Unity novel, like in size and thickness, because they put so much smaller writing and closer typeface. So it just, yeah, the books feel more <laughs> where, where Unity is just like, hey, you don't need no magnifying glass. It's in your face. And we're going to waste as many pages as possible. Yeah. <laughs> Truthfully, you shrink it down and you've probably got a 200, 300 at the push story. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I shall not mock the book anymore because I do like it. And I like the journal style of it. Yeah, that was mm. interesting. Mm. Speaking um, of journals. Go on. <laughs> no. <laughs> We've oh, alluded we, to it. <laughs> we need to, we need to cover the the fact that there are two versions. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us Wait. more. I mean, speaking of hitting word count, um, for some Oof. reason, <laughs> for, for some reason, the US version has even more pages and and text than uh, the the UK versions, or in any case, even all the translations of it. Um, I don't know where it comes from. I I wish I would get an answer one day as to why they added some text to uh, Elise's journal entry when she is uh, recalling after her trip to uh, to England with said carols and everything, um, where she basically confesses to um, having had a liaison, uh, an affair with Byron Jackson, which makes absolutely no sense. I mean, he was just some random ship captain and for some reason she just had sex with him that's only in the US version not in the UK version and I've um, I've checked uh, the French version I have it. it it's based on the UK uh, it's been translated from the UK version so this text is not in there and I had a friend in Brazil who uh, checked hers as well a friend in Portugal uh, who checked hers as well uh, her one in Italy same thing so I don't know what happened, why Americans need to have some kind of weird law, uh, extra text, but they went even ahead and added a complete journal entry to from, from Arno saying that he, well, he also slept around with women and basically also saying that he was not even living at the, the De La Serre estate anymore, that he was mm. in Paris. And you're like, but if he's not living in Paris anymore... Uh, not living in Versailles anymore. Why does Olivier just tell him to do, go take care of the horses? And like, you just don't tell someone who doesn't live under your roof anymore to go take care of things. Like, it, it just doesn't make sense. And like, not because I want to think that both of them were pure and and whatever uh, for for the first time that they they, they met in, in the Maya Haya Club, original founders of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it took, took me a few seconds to get that reference. Yes, of course. <laughs> My house. Um, it's it, it's just weird that they needed 
for the US version only that he needed to add that uh, uh, he slept around and she even says that well at least it confirmed that I loved Arno like eh, what and it, it it's like uh, let me check because I typed it out as I said they added at least in terms of word count um, at least 200 words just uh, uh, for these and then there's a complete journal entry of, of Arno which I think is roughly about three to 500 words uh, which also just contradicts what, uh, what we see in the game so I don't know who wrote that it's, just, it's a weird style even uh, it just feels added up that is strange and I want answers. Mm. Why is there? <laughs> so I said, well, uh, if I, I hear the US. So she said, I also spent time writing to father, reassuring him that my studies were continuing and that I had knuckled down. That is also in the UK version. But then after that, she adds, when it, when it came to writing to Arno, I paused. That's where the UK stopped. I paused. But in the US, she says, I paused guiltily as I found my thoughts returning to my charming smuggler, Baron Jackson. For a moment, I considered telling Arno and then reconsidered. It would break his heart. It would change everything. And why do that? Why do that when the upshot of liaison with Byron had not, as you might expect, taken my heart away from Arno? Rather, it had made my affection for him even stronger. My gut feeling that he is the one nearly confirmed. I was like, why this needed to be added? What does it add to the story? Nothing. Mm -hmm. I'll make, I'll make a, a, a series of tweets about that when we'll uh, launch <laughs> this recording. <laughs> Absolutely. Next weekend is the plan. With mm -hmm. receipts. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have receipts. <laughs> Perfect. Go on, Declan. Um, I'm just kind of confused why there is an, uh, an American version that adds all that detail in. But as you were talking about the details with the boat, you kind of jogged my memory. As, but I don't know if it's, if you guys remember, there's some line in the book where they're confused at how long the trip from France to yes. England yes. takes, because apparently they shouldn't have taken that long. And I've always wondered, I was confused by that. You know, like apparently, you know, it, it's not supposed to take that long. Did they float out to sea a lot longer? Because I know there's a bit of an extract where she's on the boat and she talks to him yeah. and she shuts so, him down. I was like, I, I the, don't understand where the story's trying to go. <laughs> Elisa's journey from Calais to Dover takes her two days. Now, if you're not from Europe or from France and the UK and you're listening to this, on a clear day, two you can days. see Dover or the, the White Cliffs of Dover from Calais. And from the English side, the British yeah. side, you can see the French coast. It's about 15 miles, 18 miles apart, the two the two coastlines. It does not take two days to... I mean, of course, it was it was sailing ships then. It wasn't, you know, ships... Yeah, with, but even then. <laughs> exactly. It wasn't going to take two days. So it's, it's just either the author fucked up his calculations and just didn't realise... Or realize, had no idea whatsoever. Or had no... Yeah. just... Just invented. stuck his finger in the air and guessed at how long the journey would take. Um, or there was an intention there. And it, in, in Freddie comments on it because he says, how can your journey have taken two days? This is when Elisa arrives in London, when it should take a few hours. I mean, nowadays you can do it on the train in 30 minutes. But anyway, <laughs> even in those days, it probably would have taken six hours. I don't know. Um, so it's just weird. But what they do, if, if you ignore the American edition of the book, is they're sparring. She, she's Elisa's out of practice with her sword play. Um, so Byron helps her kind of get back into the back into sword fighting, uh, whilst also trying to teach LM, who is Elisa's new um, <laughs> assistant, I guess, um, a bit of yeah. basic um, sort of table manners and house manners. Um, Elen seems like a sweetheart, bless her. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's that bit, Declan, you make a great point. It's just, do you know what it feels like? It feels like maybe there was going to be a story there, not necessarily the American version of the story, but there was going to be something there and it got cut or somebody missed it in editing. I mean, I'd love to know, again, we'll never know this. I'd love to know when an author is given a project like this, how much time are they given? 
who is proofreading it who is editing it are they um, proofreading well, I mean, that is that is also. A f- I mean, there's a there is a typo in the book, which I've I've seen it now every time I read it, and it does crack me up that there's a typo. But anyway, um, yeah, you do wonder if they're probably putting these out within a few months, maybe even quicker. Um, maybe it's just a, an innocent mistake, but it is bizarre. It can't be an innocent mistake because Freddie comments on it. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, and how much how much sparring sparring where they were doing. I mean, mm. the U.S. implies that they were sparing in other places than on the deck, I guess. <coughs> Indeed. But, um... <laughs> yeah. So. The U.K. doesn't mention it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, look, I found what I was looking for. Ah, see. This is, this is the only link that kind of, like, contradicts the American one. Which is kind of weird. You shouldn't, a book shouldn't contradict itself. Page yeah. one hundred and forty-nine, um, and I read Ooh, my. This opinion. is this is like being in school. Okay, children, turn your books to page one hundred and forty-nine. <laughs> well, I I had to look for it because it was annoying me why the American was doing this. But clearly, she says I missed Arno for the mm. first time. I saw that my love for him went beyond childhood friendship. I didn't yes. just love Arno, and they're in like quotation marks. I loved him. Opposite Byron nodded as though able to read my thoughts and seeing that I was serious at least. Realising I was surprised he could not claim. I understand this other he's a lucky man. Yeah. So the American version is basically weird <laughs> and contradicting everything because yeah. even Byron, he may have, you know, wanted a couple of days to flirt with Elise, but it seems he was gentle and to realise, ah, she's got someone else to think about, you know. I'm going to get into England and stop trying to be a promiscuous and dodgy boat captain. Because nobody wants a boat captain being promiscuous. There's a paragraph <laughs> that they've added uh, right after what I read. It says, like, all right, Elise, I decided. Take that tryst and keep it secret. Keep it within the pages of this journal. And instead of allowing it to be a destructive thing, something that pulls you and Arno apart, make it positive. Make it something that brings you together. What the fuck? <laughs> Okay, it's just bizarre. <laughs> I know, I know what's <laughs> happened. I uh, solved it. We have the original Unity, which is the UK one, written yeah. by an author who wanted to make a Unity novel, and then we have the American, which was written by a romantic novel person <laughs> who wanted to make a fanfic of Elise being promiscuous in every place. Or someone who imagine. really just hates <laughs> Elise because we all know that, you know, it, within Ubis- Ubisoft, female characters are not liked. So who knows? Maybe someone uh, somewhere yeah. in editing in, in the uh, editing team went like, hmm, we need to make her less likable. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Let's I, have I, her I, sleep around. <laughs> I think on this show, I'm going to use my viewership to claim that the British version is the canon version. Absolutely. (laughs) It's just backwards and weird. Whoever did the American version, you know, more details. Good. More details that ruin how all this is built. Not so good, maybe. So if you look for it, try and find a UK version because then you'll get a really more realistic (laughs) version of Elise, not. Absolutely. At least from a bar tavern who circles captains. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm trying to sound and and, and fierce, it's trying but... to take this negative and turn it into a positive. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like someone just tried to make their own Assassin's Creed Unity uni- uni- erotic fanfic, but try to stay PG. <laughs> like I want to write. That's what Archive of Our Own is for. That yeah, kind of pers- exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I take care of that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 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 can I ask? I take. Can I just change tack completely and ask? What sh- it's probably a really dumb question. Um, so Elise has a red Templar cross. We see it in the trailers. It's part yeah. of her outfit in the game. Rereading the novel today, is that Haytham's Templar cross given to her by Jenny in the box with the letters, <laughs> or am I? connecting things that don't exist it could be i think the only thing they mention is that it's jennifer scott who gave it to her mm. i mean you see the concept mm. art the uh rendition of it when you have old jennifer scott taking you know having a jewelry box or something open uh that elise sees and that's when yeah. she gives her the necklace but yeah 
Who Sorry, I know it's a complete change it. of topic, but it's, no, but it does. Um, I did wonder that today when I was rereading. It's like the letters. What's in there? Where does the <laughs> necklace come from? Where did she get it from? <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Can I ask a dumb question? <laughs> Absolutely. This is a safe space, my friend. Go ahead. <laughs> um, can somebody tell me because my years and history is terrible. What is the actual years between the Forsaken and Unity? Because listen to everyone talk about Jenny. I always thought Jenny was like in her thirties, a really young person. So I kind of, I think I've messed up with my uh, maths. I'm, I'm going to type on my very loud keyboard now, and the microphone's going to pick this up, but it's going to be great for like background audio for the recording. Oh, hey, please. <laughs> stuff that I can't remove. <laughs> Um, am I faster than you? She's born in 1713. You are way faster at Googling than I am. 1713. Um, she died in 1805. So she was very old for the time, which is kind of surprising. Really? I mean, seven, yeah. uh, 17, 1805, 13. Yeah, almost, uh, almost 100. Damn it, I've got an ad popping up. Can't even read the wiki. Here we go. <laughs> well, where would it be? Whoever writes and edits the Assassin's Creed wiki, you're doing a great job. Carry on. <laughs> yeah, um, they're great. Yeah, she's born after, well, it must be just after Edward Kenway leaves for his his trip to, to secure his own wealth. Because um, <laughs> Caroline is pregnant when he leaves. Um, yeah, that's a good age. 92. Because uh, Haytham died in 1781. Yes, I'm checking the wiki right now. Mm -hmm. 81. So I guess at his death, she got letters. Or did she? Did, did he send letters to her? Which would be kind of weird. I got the impression that he was writing to her periodically. Um, but why would be would he be rambling about Templars and assassins? <laughs> well, that's sister. a fair point. Yeah. But they weren't close, were they? They weren't close no, when exactly. they were young, and they weren't certainly weren't close when they were older. Um, mm. This is interesting strange. period. Yeah. And we, this is proof that even though I've played all the games, I still don't understand the timelines because I read it and I thought Jenny was like 30, 40 in... This was some reason took 10 years, 10, 20 years after Forsaken. So I'm definitely well, it, of the it isn't knowledge. It isn't that long after. Like, like Murray Claude no. just said, Haytham dies in 1781. It's April 1788 when Elise travels to London and yeah. meets Jenny. So it's a few years, um, later, few so years yeah, later. Seven years has passed. That's all. Not long. I mean, already in 1781, Jennifer is a an older lady. By the standards of the time, she's already an old lady um when was she born again 1713 so yeah she's already about 60 years old mm. um yeah okay i have one last remark to make if that's okay mm. go ahead hey, declan it's your show my friend <laughs> you don't need to ask permission <laughs> so I've remarked a lot um, about how Unity mirrors um, Forsaken, you know, with um, Hatham's viewpoint on peace. Mm. There, and again, this is just Declan looking into things, but there is another thing that I did think mirrored it a little, and that was in Forsaken, when you look at um, Hatham's life growing up, his dad spent more time with Hatham training him and Jenny was put to the side yeah and in the unity novel elise was done the same Al anna was brought up more of her dad more trained and elise was just pushed to the side and i was like why do i just keep seeing connections to forsaken and ac3 through unity and i just don't know if i'm going crazy or looking into these games a little bit too much <laughs> That's what we do here. We look into things too much and we like it. <laughs> yes, and I think I may have to reread Unity's novel but, now. But that's a good point, though. That's interesting. It's true. Yeah, she was kind of like put aside 
Although Jennifer was never going to be the one either, right? You know, following in, in her father's footsteps. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Which I mean, always there's, confused me. There's another massive gap in that story, isn't there? And, and um, Louise, who was speaking to us last week, she's made this point in one of her recent episodes, which is Edward Kenway was a forward thinking man. He yeah. had met many fighting women on his yeah. ju- his time in the Caribbean, yet he didn't train his daughter Jenny even in basic defense or yeah, self defense kind of self defense sword fighting. Even if he didn't bring her up as an assassin, he just didn't. And it's it's just such a huge plot hole that doesn't connect with with Edward Kenway's kind of established character that you just kind of want to tear those pages out of the book and pretend they don't exist because <laughs> it's just bizarre. True. Hmm. I think the biggest thing with Suni Nongo Shores, in my opinion, is that we need, in my opinion, again, less novels that just retell the book, but more yeah. novels that are willing to take a character that's got diminished light or take a character that deserves a bit more story to it and just weave a story for them, you know. Elise didn't get that much story in Unity, and this book gives more, and it is needed. You know, we play that half about an hour of Assassin's Creed 3 as Haytham, yet we know nothing, so the book is needed. And now we just need a Freddy Weatherall book, and we're complete. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. We definitely need one, yes. I'm never going to stop dropping that in. We need Freddy Weatherall. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Okay, let's... I wonder if there's any do... fan fiction about Freddy. I'll have to have a look at my <laughs> I'm dreading that one. Well, I, I'm sure there'll be certain types of fan fiction, but uh, I wonder if there's any kind of you know, serious That's... fan fiction. I mean, <laughs> yes, he's in mine, but it's not. <laughs> I have to look up now, sorry. <laughs> we, we, need, we need like Freddy's younger days when he was an assassin and he left the assassin order because he's, dis, he's uh, disillusioned um, and he's an expert swordsman. I'll tell you one bit that stuck in my mind mm. from the novel Declan and, and Mary Claude. And um, I might reread it now, actually, because it's Elise witnessing a leap of faith. And of course, as a Templar, she's been brought up to to, to hate the assassins in their strange mm. ways. Um, so do you mind if I just read a couple of paragraphs that I thought was, was really interesting to see a leap of faith from that, that um, outside perspective? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so this is this is Bastide, Bastide Day, or what, as it's now called Bastide. It's the storming of the Bastide, um, and she's in the crowds um, observing um, the Parisians sort of breaking their way into the fortress. I heard screams as more of the Bastide guards were lynched. Next, I caught sight of a prisoner, a frail old man who was being lifted down a set of steps leading from a prison door, and then, with a rush of mixed emotions, gratitude, love, and hate among them. I saw Arno high up on the ramparts. He was with another old man, the pair of them running towards the other side of the fortress. Arno, I called to him, but he didn't hear. There was too much noise and he was too far away. I screamed again, Arno! And those nearby turned to look my way, made suspicious by my cultured tones. Unable to do anything, I watched as the first man came to the edge of the ramparts and jumped. The jump was a leap of faith, an assassin leap of faith. So that was Pierre Bellic. Sure enough, Arno hesitated and then did the same. Another assassin leap of faith. He was one of them now. Hmm. I like that. And I'm sure her her heart got broken. I think so. And she had also failed her father because now he was an assassin and she had he had asked her to make Arno a Templar too late. Yeah. I I also kind of like read that and I was like, hmm, isn't she now realizing that her dad foreshadowed this? Because her dad mentioned, you know, that he would have qualities. And I don't think she fully understands what he meant. And then when she saw that, she was like, oh, he was right. You know, he's a natural. He will always have them qualities. But I think she still loved him. <laughs> oh, she did. Of course. Very much. But I think it was, yeah, grief again from her father for failing him. Also, she's only human. I mean, look at Arno. 
The man is beautiful. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, Declan, what else? Any any other sort of final points then from your your reading of the novel? Um, go read the book. <laughs> that is a good recommendation. <laughs> if you haven't read the book, read the book. Yeah. Like I said, and I'm always going to defend the point that. The, Unlike other books I've read for the franchise, Rough Sagan, this feels like a separate ent- entry into the franchise. You know, there's a different game that should have actually happened. And maybe we should get a bit more Unity updates from Alix's point of view, since they can technically give Odyssey possibly Origins 60 frames per second update, and everyone, Legacy consoles, PS4 and Xbox One. And technically, Odyssey was given a crossover, so Unity crossover, but it's more of a Unity mission. Just asking. <laughs> I would literally die. <laughs> and go to heaven. Absolutely. <laughs> the whole whole internet would break if they, they replayed... Uh... I, I don't know if the whole internet would break, because um, I, I am a total Unity obsessive, as is Marie Claude, but Unity is not... I'm not sure if Unity is one of the more popular... <laughs> games in, in the series let me let me just ask james then truthfully from a unity fan like me i do like unity if they release a trailer of arno walking down the streets and you hear bishops by saying wait there's something else here and you unlock a new memory and it's from elise's point of view and you get to see the <sighs> Are you telling me you would not watch it so many times you would possibly break the internet Absolutely. along with me? Oh, of course I would. I, I mean, I'd, I'd be crying. I would honestly be crying. It would be amazing. <laughs> really the, funny, the funny thing is... I fucking love that game. <laughs> and I'm just going to actually make the point here now, live on the podcast. It could work because we're not reliving Arnold's memories for a genetic source. It's on a Helix memory. They could argue that Bishop had hacked deeper and found a hidden memory base for Elise. Absolutely. And it would be canonical. And it could work. Do you know what, Declan? It would be the, it could be presented exactly the same as we talked about last week with Lydia Fry. Her memories are kind of hidden inside the animus and they're presented as that animus rift glitch at the end of the River Thames. You could use the same storytelling device. You know, there's this sudden glitch appearing on the Ile Saint-Louis in Paris and you interact with it and boom, you're following a different character's memories. It could happen. <sighs> so, <laughs> that was perfectly timed. We couldn't have done that better. That was hilarious. So 2022, drop hashtag remake AC1 and release hashtag Unity Elite Story. Done. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Let's get Sounds trending. Good. Absolutely. Absolutely. So is that all we've got time for tonight? Unless James got more points. I guess so. No, we've we've talked a load of good stuff. It's been a really good conversation and I'm glad that you've it's it's so funny that you've drawn most of if not all of the same conclusions that yeah. I had and that Marie Claude had. So I've had a great conversation. What about you, Marie Claude? I'm so glad, Declan, that you love Freddy because, you know, <laughs> We we didn't want to be alone in our love for the mm. old guy. <laughs> Bless him. So glad you like him. He will live rent free in my head as a canon <laughs> assassin turncoat who is just legendary. And if somebody at Ubisoft can give Freddy a full rendering of what he would look like, I would put him on my to do list to cosplay us because it would <laughs> just be epic. I mean, there's only gonna... one image of him that we see. He's kind of cool. <laughs> mm. Okay, I did it's not. On, know it's on Elise's image. wiki page, isn't it? I think somewhere. I know yeah. I've seen it. I'm going to Lisa, I'm going to the wiki page after this. I've not seen a photo of Freddy. <laughs> I'm looking. So, um, I think the next book that I want to try and review, um, because I've enjoyed this, mm. if I can get a copy of it, is Heresy. I haven't read that one yet, and I need to. Oh, you have to read it. I know. I know. <laughs> it's amazing. Heresy is on my <laughs> I must find it in my in my charity shop list. But I'm hoping to do Heresy in the future and AC Gold in the future because apparently that's meant to be very good. But sadly, that is all we have time for tonight. And 
if I wasn't reading eight books at once, I would try and cram in Assassin's Creed Unity reread because this book... <laughs> you can do it in a day, my friend. I did. I'm sure you, you read an, an insane amount of books. I'm sure you could... Poly- I mean, as I said, the typeface is huge. I'm sure you could polish off this book in a day. <laughs> well, technically, right now, I have Terry Pratchett, free and one omnibus to read, um, Devil's Pirate trilogy that I found randomly in a charity shop and it looked cool, um, the Ghost Story books, which is also free and one, and another Terry Pratchett book, and they're all like 500 to 600 pages with very small typeface. So, oh, and I'm about 700 pages into Stephen King's The Stand. So I will get back to reading you. <laughs> I just, the grand total of pages I need to read in a book exceed 2,700. Wow. Yeah. This is this is more of a uh, an aperitif then than a main course, this book. <laughs> <laughs> this will be my dessert from once I've <laughs> chomped down the mammoth books I have on my list and I'm still buying books. <laughs> so... Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and we would love to hear your thoughts on the Unity novel. And also, I'm intrigued, do you want a Unity crossover, which is just Elise's story as well? Um, please reach out to us at Twitter, at ac.stalk, and at James Tilliquid. You can also email me at assassinscreed.stalk at gmail.com, and I would love to hear your thoughts, and we'll see you all next week. See you all soon.